experts to talk to us on this very important subject that we must take very seriously because it's part of living, it's part of our lives. It's a continuum in terms of uh, uh, being here and hereafter. So uh, I'm just happy to have you all here and uh, I'm eager to listen to all the experts and your questions and experiences, uh, if any, and to see how many people will be converted into having uh, uh, a trust or will and uh, and that's it. And with that, I'm very happy to let you know that we have the president and chairman of council already here with us, Chief Chris Oknor, FIOD. And uh, I respectfully call him to say a few words so we can go straight into the business of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, uh, Dr. Abushunaya, DFIOD, members of the Governing Council of the Institute of Directors, Nigeria, a very distinguished keynote speaker, panelist, a moderator, our fellows and members of our great institute who are here, distinguished participants, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Governing Council of the Institute of Directors, Nigeria, I'm very delighted to join the Chairman of the Health and Social Security Committee of the IOG Nigeria, the person of Dr. Ebon Shanaya, DFIUD, to welcome you all to this edition of our 2021 webinar series with the theme, Estate Planning. I wish to Especially welcome our distinguished keynote speaker, Mrs. Emi Ogaba Oloja, the Executive Director of Stanbig IBTC, Trustees Limited. Our moderator, Mrs. BC Adiemi, MIOD, Managing Director of VCSL, Corporate Services Limited, and indeed our panelists, our very distinguished panelists of uh, Comprising of Chief Anthony DB, SEN, FIOD, Chairman Keja Hotels PLC, Mr. Norrison Quakers, SEN, Principal Partner of Jiri and Grace Atlees, Ms. Ngozi H. Mututu, LLM, DFIOD, Managing Partner of City Law Associates, and of course, Mr. Tajudin Adibuiga Kobe, FIOD, FCTI, FCA. Senior Partner, PKF Professional Services. I am particularly delighted to note that this team of experts in their various endeavors bring to us today their wealth of experience and knowledge to discuss this theme of this event. I also warmly welcome, <coughs> I also warmly welcome all other eminent personalities, guests, associates, and friends of our institute, well, of course, our media partners uh, to this event. Ladies and gentlemen, estate planning is a process by which an individual or family arranges the transfer of their wealth and assets while alive or after their death. An estate plan, therefore, aims to preserve aims to preserve, I'm sorry, something in my eye. Aims to preserve the maximum amount of wealth possible for intended beneficiaries and flexibility for the individual prior to death. It helps to manage an individual asset base in the event of incapacitation or death. The planning includes the big bequest of assets to heirs and the settlement of estate taxes with the assistance and services of estate and legal professionals. Due to observed knowledge gap with respect to the matter among individuals and families, 
we as an institute have considered it necessary to host a one day webinar on the theme to educate members of the institute, individuals and families on how to deal with inherent issues and avert future challenges in this regard. At the end of this webinar, participants would have deepened their knowledge and understanding on one, how to provide protection for, to the individual and family, two, the importance of planning for a balance between use of assets during lifetime and ensuring enough is left over to take care of the family when the individual passes on. Three, the benefit of establishing guidance for efficient and structured distribution of assets by both maximizing taxes and ensuring specific assets with the desired individuals and entities. And of course, four, particularly why the individuals need to secure the future of any family by arranging for the assistance of trusted professionals to help in the wise, wise and effective management of assets if necessary. Estate planning has been a major challenge in Nigeria. It will shock you to know that the challenge is quite prevalent among people who should know better. We therefore cannot assume that people know what to do. Instead, we should endeavor to inform and educate people on the right course of action to take to avoid any anxiety, unnecessary anxiety at that. That's why the Institute decided to work with relevant stakeholders and have this conversation on the subject by addressing the challenges arising from state estate planning in Nigeria. Our distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish to urge you to participate actively in this webinar and take advantage of the enormous wealth of experience of our panelists, of course, our keynote speaker and the moderator. I'd like to thank the chairman of the committee, um, that is members of, and members of the Health and Social Security Committee of IOD Nigeria, as well as um, all the management staff of the IOD Secretariat for organizing this uh, wonderful and timely event. May I add, ladies and gentlemen, that um, the pandemic is still there out there and it is still wreaking havoc. If you have not taken your second jab, particularly for those of us who are in Nigeria, please go and do so. For those of you who are abroad, I hear there may be a third jab, but I, I pray not. But please take care, whatever it happens, try and keep safe. And God bless, thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You Chairman. To you. I yield to the moderator. Yes, the moderator, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, welcome to this webinar on asset planning put together by the Health and Social Security Committee of IOD Nigeria. Today's topic is one of those we always push away to think about or talk about at a date in the future. Estate planning encompasses securing self, dependence, as well as entrenching values. While it is never too late to start planning, it can actually be, um, why well, it's not so early rather to start planning, it can actually be too late. What is the scope of estate planning and what vehicles are available? What is the role of investment in estate planning and what factors should be considered in selecting the appropriate investment vehicle? What are the implications of dying interstate? What are the tax considerations relevant to estate planning? So many questions, so many questions. Today's session will hopefully uh, answer a lot and more of those questions. We'll discuss other issues pertinent to the subject matter. My name is BC Adeyemi. I'm the MD CEO at DCSL Corporate Services, and I'll be moderating the panel discussion. To lead the conversation this afternoon, we'll start with a keynote address from Mrs. Emi Agaba Oloja. She's ED at Stanbic IBTC Trustees. We'll then proceed to a panel discussion, and I have the distinct pleasure of moderating a distinguished panel of subject matter experts, Chief Anthony Idigbe, SAN, Chairman Ikeja Hotels PLC, Mr. Norristin Quakers, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Principal Partner, Jairi and Grace Attorneys, 
Ms. Ngozi Chibutu, Managing Partner, City Law Associates, and Mr. Tajuddin Akwadi, Senior Partner, PKF Professional Services. We'll start with the keynote address, proceed to the panel discussion, and take questions from the audience. Please feel free to use the chat box to interact, introduce yourselves, and generally um, have conversations with the other participants. For questions, please use the Q&A box because we don't want the questions getting lost in the chat box. It does promise to be a very engaging session, so I do invite you to stay tuned as I introduce our keynote speaker, Miss, Mrs. Eme Agada Oloja. I'll just quickly um, run through her profile very briefly before I invite her to, um, to come up. Eme Agaba Oloja is Executive Director at Standing IPT Trustees Limited. Uh, among other responsibilities, she's in charge of Estate Planning Division, where she assists high net worth individuals in the creation and administration of private trust and estate planning solutions to achieve their defined objectives. MA holds a diploma in international trust management from the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners, STEP, the largest international professional body of trust and estate practitioners in the world, and is one of the five Nigerians eligible to use the designation Trust Estate Practitioner, TEP, as a full member of STEP. She also has an executive master's of business administration with distinction from the Swiss Business School of Switzerland. Please join me to warmly welcome Emmy Agaba Oloja. Emmy, over to you. Thank you, BC. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being here. Thank you to the IOG team for organizing this. I'll just speak to briefly on estate planning and then like BC had mentioned, we'll take the slides. My slides, please. So while the slides are coming up, the truth is for everything under the sun, there's a time to be born and a time to actually D-I-E. Most people like to code it. They don't like to say die. They call it all sorts of names. Peme, pai, ku, delete, transcend, expire. But truth be told, whatever it is, there is a time to actually die. But we will not die young. We will live to see our children, Amen. we will live to give the fruit of our labor, That's we will right, live man. to enjoy this world and all the good things there is. Amen. But nobody has actually tomorrow. We do not know how, when, where that you will die. So this conversation is to be able, not to frighten anyone, to be able to just bring it to the fore, that while you are doing what you're doing and while you're working so hard, it is important that you do the right thing and put a plan in place. Next slide, please. So the concept of a human life just speaks plainly to several things. The individual financial needs are strained for banking, savings, investments, pensions, insurance, and estate planning. Now we are all at different stages of our lives. Between 21 and 45, you say that they're accumulating wealth. That's when people are buying their first houses, buying their first cars, buying shares, buying all of that. And as they grow older, between 45 and 60, it's the consolidation phase when we begin to put together all that we have worked hard. We're beginning to document it. We're beginning to ascertain where these assets are held. Then we move over to the retirement stages before we go to the great beyond, the departure lounge. Now, for some people, you don't have to be at the departure lounge at a particular age because truth be told, some people have born and they die on that same day. Some people have the opportunity to, to live to see 70, 75, 80. Some people die at different times. And with the pandemic, we've seen a lot of deaths. There have been several things happening around, several calamities happening around. But like I said, we will live long. Now, next slide speaks to what estate planning is. Estate planning is just the process where assets are transferred. You have accumulated that wealth and you transfer it to your loved one. Financial planning is what most people are very conversant with. Everybody knows and begins to plan their savings. They plan their investments, where they put their monies at. And in financial planning, there are several aspects of which estate planning is one of them. There's investment planning, there's insurance planning, there's um, tax planning, and there's retirement planning. But the essence of all of this is to ensure that when you have an estate plan in place, that you have that peace of mind, knowing that if anything happens, if you got hit by a bus, like 
our colleagues usually will say offshore. If you got hit by a bus, what would happen to your hard-earned wealth? Which takes me to the next slide that speaks to what happens when there's no estate plan. Now, truth be told, a lot of things happen from fights to rancor, to hatred, to anger, to bitterness, to fear, to resentment, to challenges ahead. Because truth be told, when I was about to say when a man dies, and I remember that, that I was at a session and I said when a man dies, and a gentleman got very upset. Now, why would I say when a man dies? And we started saying, when Lagbaja dies. <laughs> and I was at another session and I said, when Lagbaja dies, I said it like three times and the gentleman there tapped me to say, I should stop saying that because truly there was a Mr. Lagbaja in the room. So we started saying when Wazobia dies. Now, when someone actually dies, the truth is in the hospital, the doctors are very quick to want to find out how they can move the bodies because the bodies will start becoming stiff and all of that. And then they're looking for who they can give the medical certificate of death because that is actually how it starts the process of getting the document that you need to be able to access the person's assets through letters of administration or where there's no will or where there's a will through um, grant or probate letters. Now, what happens is that there, people are confused they're confused for several reasons. How are they going to fend for their, themselves, their, the children that are left behind? How will they pay school fees? How will they meet up their obligations? And with all this anxiety and fear, it begins to bring worry, depression. And then you see people beginning to manifest different kinds of situations because of that. Now, what is paramount here is that a lot of us have worked very hard. We've accumulated wealth. If I asked you by yourself now, what bank accounts do you have? Top of your head, you can name them. If I asked you, where's your pension investment? Oh, and you would say to me, oh, I also have this, I also have that. What happens when people don't put a plan in place is that all their hard work and sweat gets lost. It gets lost and half the time you finally find somebody coming to say, oh, this person that has passed gave me this to hold in care. Here is it and give it on to the family, which now takes me to the next slide. So that while we are planning, there are different estate planning options. You can write a will, you can make what's called an survivor's gift. Some people have the asset holding company as a means of planning their own estates. You can have what's called um, joint ownership where assets are held jointly. Insurance is another way where people also plan their estates. There's also what's called establishing a living trust. Now, truth is you can have a combination of all these because there are some assets that an individual will have, example, your pension retirement savings account with a pension fund administrator that you cannot transfer to anyone in your lifetime. So you can't put that in your will, for instance. You can't put that in a trust, for instance, I beg your pardon, but you can stipulate what happens in your will as to how those assets will be distributed when you pass. That takes me to the next slide where I will, like, I will speak to each of the various pl estate planning options and at the end, advice on how best you can deal your individual situations because truth be told, every individual's needs, our families are different, our thoughts, our plans are different. Now, what is a will? It's just a simple document that you have written down to stipulate how the assets that you own will be used or passed on to your beneficiaries. Truth be told, anybody above 18 can write their will. It has to be one last will and testament and every given time. And for it to be validly executed, it must be signed in the presence of two individuals who are not beneficiaries. Now, the reason is you don't want to be giving somebody something and then the person sees, in quotes, that they are, they are worth more dead than alive. So you know how it is that you've seen the assets and then the person now sees, the, of what use should I wait for natural causes to take place when I see that I'm supposed to get this from this investment. That's why you can't have a beneficiary also nominating and signing as a witness. But what are the advantages of this? You are able to display your wishes. You're able to say how you want things done. The most important part for me is that you're able to provide guidance to the people that you are going to leave behind as to where the assets are. Now, when somebody dies without a will, when it's said to the person has died in testing, and when that person passes on, 
people now start ransacking their drawers, their rooms, their houses, their offices to see any document that has stipulated where they had parted money with or anything that shows where funds have changed hands as it were. But with the will or with an estate plan, you are able to itemize this bank account, this account number, this is where it is, this is investment, shares, and all of all those things, and it provides guidance. Now, your wishes are displayed. displayed. You would have stated clearly how you want things done. You can even appoint minors, um, ben, can even appoint guardians for minor beneficiaries, where you are stipulating exactly how things should pan out. He also gives the person drafting the will with the state or the testatrix peace of mind, knowing that if anything happens, there is that assurance that a document is there to speak and to provide guidance. At this point, we usually would advise that a lot of people mistake next of kin for beneficiary. Now, next of kin is actually for contact details where an individual is nominating someone in their records such that if anything happened, that person, in case of an emergency, that person should be reached. Now, beneficiary is who you choose to inherit. However, in some organizations, the two can be interwined. You can say next of kin to mean beneficiary and beneficiary to mean next of kin in organizations. But it's important that you clearly understand what it is and the intent. Because most times, people don't update their records. You have situations where there was a particular situation where a gentleman got married. And at the time he got married, he didn't know it was his brother that was named in the will, in, sorry, in the document for his um, beneficiary information. And he had gotten married, he had gotten married, he had two children, and then something just happened and he passed on. And the family were hopeful that, oh yes, he worked in a good place and they were going to get some assets that were allocated to him based on his passing only for them to look through the records and it was the brother that was named. And lo and behold, you would think that the brother would say, okay, yes, I know you are married now, he's married now and all of that and give the assets to the wife and children. But that didn't happen. The brother just came, collected all the assets and walked away with it. And that's because the gentleman failed to update his records, which is part of the things that would encourage everyone to do. As far as you're in paid employment, as far as you have documentation that speaks to things that are supposed to come to you, it's important that you update your records as your circumstances change. Now, at this point, we usually would explain to clients, look at your family situation, because a lot of people will tell you, oh, we're very closely knit. There was a gentleman in my church who had said to me once that he was on suspension, and I asked him, what did he do? And he said, there was a lady that came to his bank where he worked, and she said that her husband's account had been debited to the sum of 5 million in two installments, 2.5 each, and that she was wondering about that. And they said, you know what? Your husband was here and he presented this documentation and the CCTV had captured it that he was the husband indeed. And the woman brings out a death certificate to say, no, my husband was not here because as at the time of the withdrawals, my husband had passed. And they checked the CCTV camera and lo and behold, it was the supposed husband on the screen. And the woman said, no, that was her husband's twin brother, identical twins. And he had gone to the bank, made those withdrawals. Of course, you know how it is. Um, biometrics are not checked. You just look at the face, the same picture. He signs the signature and he had carted away with the money. Now, it's important that whatever it is, yes, I agree, you'll have closely knit families, but nobody really knows how things will pan out. That's why it's important that we advise, ensure that you put things in place to prevent the situation where your family, your loved ones, your, the people that depend on you currently are thrown out of the streets or thrown onto the streets. Next slide, please. The next slide will speak to the fact that you can have an survivor's gift. Now, some people will say, you know what? I've worked so hard, my children are grown. I just want to transfer my assets to them. I don't want to wait to, until I die. I want to see them enjoy these things in my lifetime. And then they do the transfers it avoids school base because you would have done, the, done the, the transfer in their lifetime. Assets are held in their names and they're beginning to enjoy that. Now there's a draw downside of this because I was speaking to a client once and he said to me, he won't do this. And he told me why he won't do this, that there was a friend of his in his 70s, late 70s, early 80s, 
he had done an survivor's gift and the house he lived in, he had given it to his son. The son is resident in the United States of America and he had given that asset to his son as part of the asset and he was just there in the house, retired and just living life waiting for death to come. And one morning he gets a knock on his door and the gentleman in front of him says that the house has been sold and he's the new owner. That this 80 something year old man should pack out. And the man was like, honestly, that can't be real. And they said, no, your son actually had sold this house. Now the son is selling the house when the father is still in it. So you can imagine the, the in fact, that, that was what even sent the man to his grave because he had a stroke that he just couldn't believe that his son would do that to him. But truth be told, things happen. That's why it's useful to protect the assets or find what works for you. That takes me to the next slide where I'll speak to the company structure. Now, some people have concerns around how their things will pan out. So they have family asset holding companies where they buy all these things, assets in their names, or they set up a company and they buy the property in that company name. And if they have to sell that company, sell that um, asset, they sell the company as well. But truth be told, it's not all assets that can be put into a company. For instance, the balance in your retirement savings account, you cannot transfer it into a company in your lifetime. So it's to find again what works. Now, the drawback or the concerns are that you will be required to do your, fi your filings, the tax computations and all of that, and you begin to pay all the statutory fees for running the company. But it is one of the ways where people can put a plan in place. And that takes me to the next slide that speaks to insurance, I believe. Sorry, joint ownership. Now for joint ownership, we were speaking earlier for those that were on in on the conversation early this, this afternoon. Assets held jointly simply means that both your names are stipulated in the account opening documentation. Mr. A and Mrs. B, their surnames. And then the instruction in that record is that either can sign. You have situations where people have the asset or the accounts in their sole names. However, if anything happened, they believe that that asset, because they have included their spouse or any other party as a co-signatory, that that asset can just be transferred. No, it has to be held in both your names and the instruction that should be in it must be either consigned so that if one party dies, the law of survivorship will apply and that asset doesn't have to go through the probate process. Now, there are some concerns around that. Some people will tell you, you know what? I cannot trust my partner in this kind of situation. If the person is a centric, why would I be saving and the person is spending the money? So they have reservations around giving that. But like I, we always explain, ascertain what works best for you to understand how best you can deal your estate plan. The next slide speaks to the insurance where we advise clients have an insurance plan. Insurance plan, there's what's called group life insurance. As far as they are in paid employment, the Pension Reform Act stipulates that every employer must have employees, as far as their minimum of three, they must have the pension fund account, their retirement savings account, and that they should have a group life insurance in place for these individuals, such that should they die in service, that asset, can, they can get the beneficiaries to receive assets. In some cases, it can be three, or five times the total emolument. I was at a session once and somebody asked me to say, must I die in the office to qualify for group life? No, you don't have to die in the office just in case somebody is being rushed to the hospital and they say, no, take me to the office. I want to die on the MD's desk so that they will see that I've died. No, as far as they are in that paid employment, that group life insurance would apply and it's payable. There's a beneficiary declaration form that we encourage employees to fill that nominates who they want to receive benefits from their group life. It's also important here to mention that some people also take out funeral insurance, such that if anything happened, the insurance company will carry out their funeral expenses, pay for all that is required for their funerals, and then deal that. The drawback on some instances where you have issues around insurance claims. Now that takes me to the next slide that I'll speak to trust. Now, what is a trust? Just an arrangement where assets are transferred to a trustee to hold in trust for certain beneficiaries. You can set up a trust for any local purpose. People set up for education. People set it up as an estate plan. The assets that are in the trust do not go through the probate process because assets that are held in the trust do not belong to the individual. 
the trustees own it, but they own it for beneficiaries of the trust. With a trust, asset protection is in place to a large extent, where those assets, like I mentioned, don't, don't go through probate. Your creditors cannot come to come and access those assets as long as the asset in question or the trust was not set up as a sham to defraud or to abuse. Now, the probate process requires people to make the application to the courts. With a trust arrangement in place, there's no probate process. What will happen is that we'll just carry out your wishes as you have itemized it in what's called the letter of wishes, which will be used to produce the trust deed, which is the binding document between you setting up the trust as settler and us as trustees so that we can achieve that objective. Now, what happens, the trust can be named as a beneficiary for group life, especially where they're minors, you can name the trust as a beneficiary for group life so that you are able to have your trustees follow through on your wishes. You can have what's called a living trust, which you set up in your lifetime. You can also be a beneficiary of that trust, or you can have testamentary trust provisions articulated in your will so that if anything happens to you, your will, your executors can then look for those provisions and then set up a trust in place to continue your wishes in line with what has been stated. Now that takes, this now takes me to the final slide where I would summarize what I've said. Truth be told, we've all worked very hard. What this exercise is about is for you to sit down and ascertain wherever you have spent money, ascertain what assets you have, how is title held, is it in bank accounts? Our phones are even now digital assets in themselves because most of our bank statements, most of our investments, crypto and all of that is tied to those accounts. It's tied to your phone, it's tied to those wallets, it's tied to all those things. So ascertain what you have, where they're held. Now review your current position. Ascertain where you have, what you have named in your beneficiary declaration form. What have you written? When did you update it? Has your circumstances changed? Look through to ensure that, look, we are putting things in place. Because like we mentioned earlier, nobody has promised you tomorrow. We know that we will live long to see our children's children, but you need to be able to safeguard your heart and wealth. For those that have pension assets, because a lot of people will say, you know what, I really don't have anything. But your retirement savings and account is an asset in itself. If for nothing else, your personal bank account and your retirement savings account can be assets that you include in a will where you would have stipulated how you want those assets distributed to your beneficiaries in percentages. And then it's important to have insurance policies in place. Take out an insurance policy. Group life, confirm from your em employer, do they have it in place? Because it is required by law, the Pension Reform Act of 2014 revised states that that should be in place, so confirm. And most importantly, speak to professionals. It's important that you speak to a professional. Family Capital Trustees is one of those professionals and the, that can assist you in putting together the plan, reviewing your individual circumstances so that when the event does happen, you are sure that your hard work, your hard sweat, and your beneficiaries will be safeguarded. My charge to you today, do take action to ensure that all you are working for will not go down the drain. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emmy. Thank you for that very insightful and down to earth presentation. Um, very relatable. So I'll just quickly take a few points to summarize some of the key learnings from um, Emmy's presentation. Um, the whole essence of estate planning is to ensure that we have total peace of mind. You know, having acquired all those assets, um, you want to go to bed at night knowing that you have um, carefully taken care of your would-be beneficiaries. Um, she also reminded us that there are various options for estate planning. She described the various methods. Uh, it's a Bible gift, living trust, will, uh, limited liability, company insurance, and joint ownership. Um, I'm sure there are a few questions that have flowed even from there. I have a few of those myself, uh, myself, which I have noted now. Then she spoke about this vexed issue of next of kin, the fact that you need to cont continuously update your records wherever you have indicated someone as your next of kin. It doesn't mean they're going to be your next of kin forever, for all time. Just ensure that you uh, continuously update that. She also admonished that we are setting our assets 
on at every point in time. What, what, what do we hold? Where are those um, assets? And what's their status? Um, and every point in time to ensure that um, if our circumstances have changed, we should update those. And most importantly, she reminded us that tomorrow is not promised. Thank you very much, Emmy. Um, so we're going to move on to the panel uh, conversation now. And it's at this point that I introduce um, members of my very distinguished panel. Um, I'll start first with a distinguished SN. I'm very lucky today I have two studio advocates of Nigeria on the panel. Um, first one that I would introduce is Chief Anthony Itikbe, SAN, who is also the chairman of Ikeja Hotels uh, PLC. Chief Itikbe was elevated to the rank of Senior Advocate of Nigeria in 2000 and was recently admitted to practice in Ontario, Canada. He's a well-known capital markets legal advisor and has advised and acted as counsel to the Securities and Exchange Commission. You're welcome. Chief EDP. Thank you. Second panelist is Mr. Norisim Quakers, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Principal Partner, Jairi and Grace Attorneys. He's a seasoned legal practitioner with decades of experience in legal practice, who has vast experience and advices on all aspects of commercial law and corporate law, including business restructuring. He has been identified as one of the top 100 lawyers in Nigeria in City Lawyer Publishers List and was called to the inner bar in 2011. He's a member of several professional bodies, including but not limited to Chartered History of Administrators, the Nigerian Maritime Association, Maritime Arbitration of Nigeria, and was secretary to the National Working Group on the Review of the Law of Evidence and Administration of Justice in Nigeria. You're welcome, Mr. Quickers. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Also join me in welcoming Ms. Ingozi, Ms. Ingozi Chibutsutu, who is the managing partner of City Law Associates, prior to which she was the was Commonly Secretary and Legal Advisor at Rwanda PLC, a role she held for several years. Before then, she was State Counsel at the Federal Ministry of Justice. She's past president of the International Women's Society, a distinguished fellow of the Institute of Directors of Nigeria, member of the Chartered Institute of Directors of member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators UK, International Bar Association, the Nigerian Bar Association, as well as the International Federation of Women Lawyers. You're welcome, Ms. Chibutsu. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next on the panel is Mr. Tajuddin Adekweega Akonde. Mr. Tajuddin Akonde is a senior partner, PK Professional Services, prior to which he was Director of African Regional Board of PKF International, representing West Africa sub-region. He started his career at Deloitte. He's a chartered accountant, a tax practitioner, financial analyst with over 30 years experience. He's an alumnus of the Lagos Business School and the Harvard Business School. You're welcome, Mr. Akonde. I welcome you. you all. And you um, so we'll kick it off straight away with um, a question to Chief Itibe um, SAN. So in the course of our presentation, Amy had mentioned that, you know, if you don't write a will, what it means is that you will die in test state and those, that has uh, certain implications. So I'd like the learned senior advocate to share with us um, some of the implications of dying um, in test state without, without a will. Thank you so much. Uh... Ade, I mean, uh, ADBC. I'm really uh, very grateful for this opportunity and I want to thank the uh, uh, president of the IOD for the opportunity as well as the committee that organized this. Um, I think really that the um, question is whether living or dying, you know, where is the best place from which to rule? Because it is said that when you write a will, it means that you are ruling from the grave. Uh, but when you are alive, you are ruling from life. And so there's a challenge there uh, between the two. Uh, in terms of the implication of dying in test state, I should say that first of all, dying in test state means that there's no will as uh, 
Mrs. Um, Agabo Oloja has said, or that there is a will, but the will does not cover the property in, in issue. Uh, the, if, you, if you do not have a will, the implications will be that, as she has pointed out, you lose the opportunity to appoint your executors. Uh, also, your, the distribution of your assets will be according to intestacy rules. And um, some questions have been asked about what those rules are. I would uh, try to deal with it. Um, also, you, you may not be able to appoint guidance uh, for your children or others who lack capacity. Uh, your burial preferences may not be achieved. Uh, of course, there are risks of a, a estate duty and tax, and, and uh, the, there will be no charity because it will devolve to only your blood relations, and the state will take your estate in default if there's nobody who is entitled. Uh, so clearly there are risks around uh, dying in estate, and uh, there are basically two ways that it is managed. Uh, the first is the individual or corporate approach, uh, which uh, Mrs. Uh, Agaba Oloja has dealt with extensively, talking about uh, writing a will and then estate planning. For the company, it's about uh, succession uh, planning. However, the state does not leave you alone. So the state also intervenes. And if you look at, say, Lagos State Section 49 of the Administration of Estate Law of Lagos State, it provides a certain uh, a priority. It says who can take the estate and get letters of administration, who can manage it. Uh, and in terms of who will take it, uh, it says the spouse, the spouse takes priority and gets one third of the estate and the, the children will get um, a, a two thirds. Uh, and at, if they fail, then the brothers, the siblings uh, and sisters, brothers and sisters, siblings will then, will then uh, take. Uh, if there are no children, it will be shared between the spouse and uh, the uh, sibling. But in other countries, it varies. For instance, in Canada, uh, the spouse takes 50% uh, uh, of what you are left with. So I just want to make the argument that it is actually a fallacy that dying tested enables you to rule from the grave. It doesn't really work exactly that way. First, you have the rule against perpetuity. So you cannot really decide that things will be forever. It, it has to be handed over to other people who will then make the decisions. Otherwise, the rule of against perpetuity will apply to avoid any, any bequest that you make that you want to rule in perpetuity from the grave. Also, your choices may not be the best. Actually, your choices may not be the best as a testator, as somebody writing a will. I, have, I, I dealt with a will as a young person where the person, uh, the person uh, gave all the properties, all he had to his two sons who were the younger ones. And he had two daughters who were the older ones and he had a wife. He didn't give the wife anything. He didn't give the two older uh, 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 children who were uh, female anything. But he said that the wife and the, 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 the eldest daughter should run the estate. What do you think happened? They fought, <laughs> they kept fighting. Sick. So Absolutely. it doesn't mean that your choices are the best. You mm -hmm. cannot determine everything also under the law in Nigeria. For instance, the Wills Act in, in, in Lagos State, go and read it. It says that, you know, the, if you are a Muslim, there are certain things you can't, you can't deal with in your will. In fact, even under customary law, there is a case of the Supreme Court that in Benin, you cannot give out the family house in your will. So it's not true that it's a fallacy to suggest that you can rule from the, will, uh, from, from the grave. Then so, it's sorry, also sorry, can, I, can, I, can I quickly can I quickly interrupt you? Um, yes. um, if you don't mind, Chibi, you know, because yes. this bit about what you can and you cannot um, in your in your will, and also the fact that you know, I just want to stay on the fact that you didn't even write a will at all. You know, so you're saying yeah, that I'm, I'm, if, I'm if coming you died to that, in Lagos just, State, okay, yes, yeah, if I'm you died in Lagos State, I will, okay. I will explain. I will explain how you know, it all connects to the topic, which is why you should plan, right? Mm. But mm. when you're planning, you have to be careful. Mm. And, and, I, and even when uh, Mrs. Agaba, Agaba spoke, she spoke about somebody who did a living will that had a challenge, why you need professionals. I'm put, mm. pointing out these fallacies. So you mm. find out that you actually need professionals who have experience to guide you. Mm. So it's also a fallacy that dying in state leaves your estate in ruins. Why? Because there's a default scheme under the administration of estates 
law, under Islamic law, under customized law, to deal with, you, with, with, with your estate. Also, mm -hmm. your wish is presumed, but it may not be the best. I've just told you that they presume that your mm -hmm. wife should get a one-third. In some other countries, you get 50%. And in some countries, they actually do not let you rule. Because, for instance, in Canada, even if no matter what you give anybody in the will, the surviving spouse has an option to elect whether to accept what you put in the will or to accept the 50% which the person is entitled to under the Family Law Act. So some countries, if, for instance, in the US, if it's a community property, if it's just the community property, you may not be able to give it out as you like in your will. So the, mm -hmm. thing, the issue is that there's a balance between taking care of yourself and also transferring wealth whilst living. The issue of the living trust has been mentioned. And mm -hmm. the idea is this, that, you know, why do you want to actually keep things till you are dead? Why mm -hmm. don't you transfer some property when your children can still make use of it, when they are, and they are, and they are strong and when it can help them to grow? So mm -hmm. there has to be a balance. And when you look at it, the issue is not really about only transferring wealth but transferring skill and knowledge. Because when you are dead, it may be too late to engage in estate planning. In other words, if you say everything should be given out only when you are dead, then you know, at that stage, it's already too late. If the children are already bad, if they are not used to managing property, if they are not used to managing wealth, then they may not be able to manage it properly. So uh, the summary of what I am saying is that although there are implications, if you die in test it, it is not so bad because there is a default mechanism provided by the state to deal with the situation. But that mechanism may not meet your wish. Even Absolutely. though, as I said, your wish may also not be the best. Therefore, the, the best thing to do is to go to professionals so that you can marry the gaps in the uh, uh, wheel system and the gaps in the intestate system to achieve the best uh, uh, outcome That's for fun. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. I'll just ask you one other question before I move on to um, the other panelists. Um, and this is this. So you've mentioned the Lagos State um, law. So assuming that I'm a Muslim, you know, and I would prefer to have um, Islamic law, you know, be the one that would determine what happens to my estate. Do I have a choice? I mean, is there, which which one would be, would be supreme in the event that one, uh, that is intestate and one is not able to, to actually say which one you prefer to, to have rule your affairs. Well, uh, under the, yes, uh, on that, uh, let me take it for instance, let's say, because we do a couple of cases in places like Kano. Uh, if it's in Kano, you go to the, what, what will be the Islamic court and then they issue you what is the equivalent of letters of administration and they, they, they decide how the distribution will be done. So the way it works there is that they have, they follow Islamic principles to make the distribution. They make an, uh, they make an order, which is like a letters of administration. And then that's what you use. Now in Lagos state, if you wrote a will, if you wrote a will and you are a Muslim, there, there are certain things that you must give to certain people. If you didn't give those things to those people, they can challenge the will under the will's law of Lagos state. So you, you can also, uh, uh, you can use the same principle to apply. So for instance, as to who will be the, um, uh, who we apply for the letters of administration, you can do that under Islamic law. In other words, nominate the person where, the, the, for instance, it may be a, a, it may be a brother, uh, mm -hmm. it may not necessarily be the, uh, the wife, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera you know, that can apply. And then uh, the, the distribution as well, it can be under the native law and custom, which means, which includes uh, Islamic law. However, it, the, if it's landed property, you have to distribute the landed property according to the leg situs. That is the law where the, the land is located. So you will distribute personal property according to the native law and custom, which will include uh, Islamic law. But mm -hmm. the property itself, you have to distribute according to the, um, the, no, the law no. of um, Lagos State, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Um I'm coming to you, Mr. Quakers, and it's um, 
following on from where we just stopped off, you know, uh, Chief Felipe had mentioned that there are certain circumstances when the will can be challenged, one of which if, is if you, for instance, uh, will property that you're not supposed to will under um, Islamic law. Um, so what are the other circumstances under which a will can be challenged? Uh, thank you so Mr. much, uh, Mrs. Adebisi, um, the chairman of this um, section of IOD, and also the president. I thank you for this opportunity to be part of this discussion. Now, clearly, the paper presented by Mrs. Agaba or Loja Eni is quite uh, clear on the face of it. Um, there are no hiccups, very lucid. So the question you then ask yourself is with all of this, how come we always have problems in a situation where people go to court to challenge a will when a testator has taken time to first identify his assets and then prepares the distribution of the assets while he's yet alive. And like we say in law, a, a, a will is ambulatory. It only speaks after death. Now, why then do we end up challenging wills? One of it, for instance, is testamentary capacity. Now, where a man does not have the mental capacity to do a will, and he does a will, it can be challenged. Now, how do you determine testamentary capacity? If you have someone who is senile, for instance, and he does his will during the period of his senility and ends up giving certain things to certain categories of persons, other beneficiaries can actually challenge the will that the testator lacks the mental capacity to have done the will. Now, over time, because of judicial pronouncement, you now have cases that also come up in terms of family property. Now, a husband and wife are li living together and they own a property. Now, the husband in his will now gives the property to a particular beneficiary in his will without recourse to the fact that the property is jointly owned. Now, when death occurs, the wife can challenge it if the property is given to another person other than herself. Now, another issue to also look at in that regard is if a divorce occurs and the will has already been given and then the man subsequently dies or the woman subsequently dies, what then happens to the property? You cannot have, and I recall that earlier when we were discussing it, we talked about the concept of survivorship. Now, there's a particular case that also occurred in Portaco where the husband and wife, the woman had no contribution towards the acquisition of the property, but it was defined as matrimonial property, therefore jointly owned. Whether she added money to the purchase or not is irrelevant. It was an asset that was acquired after marriage. Now, the concept of undue influence is also something that uh, we look at when it comes to uh, challenge in a will. Now, there's a particular case, some of us were on this part of our lawyers, uh, Johnson and Maja, where a testator gave a property to his mistress. It was challenged by the wife. And the court said, whether he's morally upright or not, does not justify the challenge to the will. The man did not lack mental capacity when he gave the property to his mistress. So that's, that challenge was uh, unsuccessful. To that, to that extent. Now you also have another issue, which we also describe as, as property being identified as your property. You must be sure of what you're given. When you draw up the list of assets, you must be certain that the property that you're given is yours. Now you can also challenge a will based on due execution. Has it been properly executed? You can also challenge the will when it, when it, when it borders on attestation. There's also what is called the attestation clause. You recall that earlier when uh, Mrs. Onoja was addressing us, she said, if you have a beneficiary who also attests or witnesses to the will, ordinarily with that conduct, that will becomes a nullity. The will is nullified by virtue of that. A will in totality, must be formal. In other words, it must be written. The testator must be of sound mind. It must mm -hmm. have defined beneficiaries. The property in question must also be defined. It must also be witnessed. It must be done in the presence of witnesses, at least two who must co-sign and endorse. You must be clear as to the property that you're giving out. 
in relation to that. Now, what then do you do most times to ensure that this is complied with? Usually it is done by professionals. The language of the will must also be clear. It must not leave room for ambiguity. It must not be suggestive. You don't leave it to the court to conjecture what the, the beneficiary, uh, the testator uh, attempted to give. So once the will is drawn up, it must be shown to the testator to approve of its content before it is finally registered. So to that extent, this is, these are the conditions or grounds by which a will can be, be, be challenged and can be successfully challenged. Thank you, thank you very much. I have um, a question and perhaps another one um, flowing from that. So what happens if um, I prepare a will, you know, um, while single um, because I have some property and then I subsequently uh, get married and before I have the opportunity of um, updating the will, um, you know, the inevitable happens. What, what's how valid will that will be? The will well, let's, 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 that, that, that's, that's, that's on the one side. Okay. Um, and in the same manner, let's say I then prepare a will and um, if I get married and I get married, um, perhaps get divorced and then subsequently uh, pass on those two scenarios, what happens to the validity of the will? The will remains valid. Remember what we said, the will speaks mm -hmm. only after death. Mm -hmm. Once the testator dies, the will speaks. Mm -hmm. What you intended to do is what you have done with the will. In so far as there's no codicil, there's no amendment to that existing will. Whoever mm -hmm. is disclosed as the beneficiary of the will will take benefit of the will without more. <laughs> Okay, well, just if I may just say that, um, uh, like here in Canada, the um, the marriage will automatically cancel all previous disp dispositions. So um, uh, again, that's because I, I the, would, the application of the of the uh, Family Law Act. I, I think these are um, uh, areas where we can push the jurisprudence in in, in Nigeria as to what is the impact of um, the marriage on, on marriage. the will. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, does it uh, cancel all your previous uh, dispositions, um, etc. And then uh, that's how you may need to do a prenup uh, and things like that to manage uh, some of some of that um, 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 risk. It's actually a minefield. <laughs> so. So, so as, it, as it is now, the position of the law is that the, the will remains valid. Obviously, you know, it can be challenged. Um, I guess that would just be a ground for challenge. The other question that I ask, I have for you, um, Mr. Quivers, is what happens to property that I acquire um, after I have written the will and I haven't had the opportunity of writing a codicil? It, it comes under what we describe as uh, your residual estate. And I recall that uh, Chief Tony Digby, while he was addressing us, also referred to it in that context, even though you have not done the will, that will come under you at the administrative estate law because your will didn't cover it. So letters of administration will be taken out for the purpose of administering the properties acquired that were not recorded in your will. So it, it, come, it goes under your residual estate. Yes. Thank you so much. Just to add to what he said, again, you can, the residuary estate clause will be able to uh, enable you manage it within the will. So there's no need to apply for uh, interstacy for that uh, property that is not covered. But then who does it go to? You know, so, so I mean, I have, I have three, four beneficiaries and I've assigned to them. Who, do, who then does this particular property that I haven't um, specifically uh, bequeath to anyone who does it also if you usually your residuary clause would say something like anything that i didn't think of that uh, i acquire mm -hmm. subsequently will go to say my children equally so that there is no problem mm -hmm. but assuming you don't have that residuary clause okay. it you will go to the default provision clause, which means absolutely. you will do a set yeah interstacy rule so it will mean mm -hmm. your wife will get uh, uh, one third your children will get mm -hmm. to third if you don't have children then mm -hmm. your your siblings will get to third Absolutely, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm coming to you now, Ms. Chipotitsu, um, and a lot has been said about the rights of women um, to inherit um, in, in Nigeria, in some parts of Nigeria, 
um, women cannot inherit property and um, all sorts. Can you speak to that for a minute? What, what are the, what's the status of um, inheritance as far as women is concerned in some parts of Nigeria? Well, thank you very much. Let me first of all thank the Dr. Shonaya for inviting me. I also thank the president of the IOD for also inviting me. The female, the issue of female inheritance, I will look at from two perspectives. 2014, uh, post-2014 and pre-2014. You'll know why I'm saying that. In the past, virtually all our societies were dominated, uh, even not only Nigeria, worldwide are male dominated. Consequently, before uh, women, females were able only to inherit from the male line, from husbands, from fathers, etc. That is no longer the situation today. Uh, uh, in addition, marriage played a, a significant role in the issue of inheritance. With Mr. Miss, both Mr. And Mrs. Idibe and uh, Mr. Qu uh, Quakers have spoken about uh, will about uh, preparations of wills and so on and so forth. And the will is very important when you are thinking of a statutory marriage. Most marriages in Nigeria are not statutory marriages. Most marriages in Nigeria are marriages under custom. In, in, in Igbo land, in those days, women would not inherit. In the South, in, in the Southwest, the, 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 issue, the practice was Ori Ojori or Idigi. In the North too, uh, Sharia was the uh, rule of the thumb. But post 2014, the Supreme Court held in a famous case, uh, I call it famous because uh, it changed the perception of, uh, female, uh, of the female gender and in terms of inheritance. The Supreme Court, Supreme Court held in UKJ and UKJ that any custom that pro prevent, prohibited a female from inheriting uh, a, a, a property from her father, from whoever, was no, would, would be considered null and void. Why? Because the Constitution, Section 42 of the Constitution, specifically stipulates that nobody will be discriminated against on grounds of circumstances of birth. In addition to that is the Evidence Act. Section uh, 18, I believe, of the, uh, Section 18 of the Evidence Act, which also says that any custom that is contrary to uh, um, that that is uh, contrary to uh, uh, what, what, equity and so on and so forth, natural right, process and equity, yes, would not be deemed null and void. So as of today, females all over Nigeria can inherit, and. When we talk about inheritance, we only talk about women inheriting from fathers and mothers. We too, we many of us women, we pass on things. We are all, you know, in those days we didn't, we didn't go to school in the 19, 1900s, not before I was born anyway. But even my mother's generation, we have things that we can pass on. And, you know, I think that uh, Mrs. Uh, Agama has done a very beautiful job by telling us, advising everybody to plan your estate. I know when my mom was alive, my dad said, let's, let's get her to write a will. I said, no. Why did I say so? I said it was too, too morbid. He had written his will and he told me that, you know, that it was time for her to write her, her will. I said, no. Well, you know what happened? She died in test it. So we had to do the probate and most of the money she got, of course, went off. So the females should think of themselves, not only as uh, inheritance and uh, those inheriting, they should also think of, of themselves as, you know, making sure that they are, whatever they acquire in their lifetime goes to who they want it to go to. 
So here's a question. Thank you very much, Mal. Thanks so much. Um, so sorry, you can know, I, can I, sorry, yes, uh, Mrs. Uh, Adebisi, if no, I may add something to what uh, yes. Mrs. Chibutu to say. There's also a problem that has been festering for quite a while. And what is that issue in relation to um, the uh, bequests being made by the status to um, daughters or women as opposed to men? And that is if a man in his lifetime practice a particular custom, right? A particular custom that recognizes, insofar as it is not repugnant to natural justice, equity, and good conscience, right? Mm -hmm. in, in distributing his assets through his will, mm -hmm. the court will oppose that distribution. An mm -hmm. example, for instance, uh, you have a first child who is a woman and you now have a second who is a man. Now, in terms of the distribution of the wealth or the assets, the man now chose to give, let's say 60% of his assets to the male child, mm -hmm. to her, and then maybe 20, if his custom recognizes that practice, it will not be, it will not be considered as repugnant to natural justice, equity, and good conduct. The same court, so sometimes, you have this sort of situation. I guess, I guess, I guess we'll go and test this in court. I guess that's, yeah. that's Indeed, right. I was going to go there. If we go to the court, <laughs> based on Lukeji and Lukeji, the female will succeed. That's, yeah. what, that's what I think. That's what Absolutely. I, think. I, I, I sort of agree with you, ma'am. I think so as well. But, you know, the question I was going to ask you, you know, was related to, you know, the, bit you, the point you made, because we're always looking at it from the angle of the woman inheriting. You know, but she also has property that she can yes. she can pass yes. on. You know, so yes. so what happens? In she even has more you know, property is... now. She has more property than the men. <laughs> no, yes. the men. So yes. what happens in a situation where you know you know you know this thing about joint ownership, co ownerships? Um, um, Emmy mentioned some of those in her presentation. And you know, in the bit of you know, we're happily married. We want to do things together. And so the woman buys a property. And they ask her, you know, you want to register the property in whose name? And she say, Mr. and Mrs. X Y Z. You know, and um, the man in writing his will, um, you know, that same property that has the woman bought with her own money, you know, but they sort of registered in the name of the couple, you know, bequeaths that property to, to his mistress. I'm just being outlandish here, but mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. it's possible it could happen, you know. Um, and then unfortunately, the woman um, passes on before he does. I mean, so, um, and eventually, he also then passes on and that property. Is that a ground for contesting the will, do you think? <laughs> I would think so. I would think so, especially if there is proof that this mm -hmm. the, the, the funds to uh, uh, acquire the property came from the woman. There must be, there must be I'm sure there will be. That's what I think. But, well, what, what can she do to forestall sort of situation happening? What do you reckon, what, do you, what would you advise? I, I think just like for the men, because when we talk about wills, we're talking about men. For the men, you, you, for, we, all, we too, it, it behoves us to also spe spe spell out, you know, uh, in, in our will, what we, what we want done. Mm. So and, uh, you know, a will is not necessarily a, something that a lot of You can just get out a piece of paper and write it. This property was bought by, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can go ahead. Hello, ma'am. Can I we go? Can on? Hear you. Go ahead. Yes, please okay. go ahead. I said, this, this property, explain, give, give a recital as to how the property came about, you know, and then, you know, I, when on my uh, departure, this is what I want done. That's what I would do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank That's you. That's what I would Thank do. Very much. Thank you very much. Can if I, you have time, can we'll I, come can back. I chip, yeah. Can I chip okay. into that? Please uh, As to how other uh, systems have tried to manage that issue. Mm. Uh, of protecting the, the, the rights of the spouse. It's very simple. Let's say in the Canadian system, it's about equalization, what they call equalization. So whether it is by divorce, whether it's by separation, whether it's by death, there is a right of equalization. In other words, financial equalization, that the properties will be divided equally between the two spouses. So when you do a will, the uh, surviving spouse has six months within which to elect whether to accept the, what you gave in the will or whether to insist on equalization. And once they do equalization, 
uh, they'll just divide it to make sure that everybody gets equal. And that's that's their simple solution. So all those issues about who bought the property, who paid this or who did that, you just fight to death. They fight to self-destruction, you know? Here, death, divorce, is exchange of financial statement. No fight, no struggle, you know? But we fight and fight and fight till everybody is self-destructed and then uh, relationships are, are, uh, melt, you know? Enmity goes on for generation when it's actually a simple financial issue. Sorry. Can I can I also uh, can I can I, can I chip in? Please you know, as we develop, we also learn. Uh, you know, Bill Gates and his wife just yeah. parted ways, mm. uh, and uh, I think the main reason why she there is not too much of a challenge is because of the existence of a prenuptial agreement. Absolutely. And I Absolutely. think we should all, you know, buy into that concept. Mm. Thank you. Absolutely. Can I also add my Thank voice to take? Please go ahead. Now, um, this issue has already been addressed by the highest court in the land. Incidentally, because Nigeria is a um, I think that oh, that question so. was frozen right as he was <laughs> trying to answer. As he was trying to answer, I don't. I don't want to say he's frozen, but anyway. So um, we we'll, would we'll, we'll move on. We we'll move on to you know. But I was just going to say actually that I think that there's a lot um, that we need to do as far as our own laws are concerned. You know, I thoroughly and absolutely want to go and live in Canada right now, uh, given all that. <laughs> <laughs> if you no said, room for us. You know, I honestly, um, you know. But on a serious note, I think there's a lot that we need to look at in our, in our laws as far as uh, inheritance and um, these issues are concerned. But I'll quickly now go to um, another interesting aspect of estate planning, which is the tax implications. I see there are already some questions in this regard. Um, so I would like Mr. Akwande to quickly, you know, just um, address a few um, areas of estate planning and sort of give some brief highlights as to what we should look out for as far as the tax implications are concerned of the various options that Emmy had shared with us um, earlier on. Mr. Akonte. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the president of IOD and also Dr. Shonaya for inviting me. Um, when it comes to taxation, um, the general saying is no one is too young and no one is too old to pay tax. And it might not surprise you to hear that uh, the fact that you die does not mean that you may not have tax liability. When a man leaves, you pay tax on your income, assets that you own, that generate income, and income, the definition cover all sort of your sources of income. When the person passes on, of course, the tax liability then falls on the estate, the personal representative of the estate, the estate is shared. Uh, up front, one interesting thing about our environment is that unlike other jurisdictions, like the United Kingdom, United States of America, or even South Africa here, as of today, Nigeria cannot be said to have an organized, a structured debt tax, so to say. You see, debt tax is a liability that continues to attach to a person during his, you know, um, after his, um, he has died, he died. Well, there are two forms of it. What we call the estate tax, which is a levy on the person estate. Estate tax is assessed on the deceased estate as a whole in the hands of the personal representative of the estate. Whereas inheritance tax is paid by a person who has inherited, who has shared from the estate. Now, in Nigeria, as I said, as of today, we do not have you know, um, any legal, any law, that is guiding either estate duty or inheritance tax. 
what we had was the capital transfer tax of 1979. But that legislation was abolished in 1993. So after the abolition of the Capital Transfer Tax Act of 1979 in 1993, um, there was nothing in our legislation that covers what happens to the estate of a deceased person. However, there are some other tax laws where we will find some aspect of capital transfer tax. For instance, in the Capital Gains Tax Act, where a person died, the estate of that person is assumed to be transferred to the personal representative at the market value as of that time. However, the Capital Gains Tax Act exempts that asset from tax. Even if the estate is eventually distributed, shared among beneficiaries, either in line with the will, or if the person died in the state in accordance with uh, custom, the letter of administration and all that, the, 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 the beneficiary will be assumed to have acquired that asset at the value as at the date which the owner died, as if it was the original acquirer, like the personal representative. And again, they will not be liable to any capital gains tax. So under the capital gains tax, there is nothing that covers the assets of a deceased person um, when the person died. Now, for those who are familiar, and I've seen that we have three, two sides and other lawyers in the panel, those who have had to deal with letters of administration, either in legal state or in other jurisdictions, would not be all familiar with what the registrants charge before a letter of administration is issued, which is 10% of the value of the assets. I think this is common. Um, before you will be given the letter of administration, the assets left behind will be aggregated, valued, and 10% more to pay. I am not aware of any law in Nigeria that backs the payment of 10% duty. But this is happening. Again, the other uh, liability which could come from inheritance is, for instance, if property that passes on, where, as in Lagos State, there is land use charge. Of course, those who inherited properties will now begin to pay uh, the tax, the land use charge on the properties that they have inherited. And if it is in the trust, the trustees, the executors of the estate will be the one liable for the land use charge. Under the, capital, the Personal Income Tax Act, there are some provisions that covers income that may accrue to a deceased person or to the estate of a deceased person. In that, when income that a deceased person is supposed to have had up to the point of his death, when that income comes, of course, it will be liable to tax under the provisions of the Personal Income Tax Act. Where a deceased person is also before his death is in employment and is liable to tax under the Personal uh, Pay As You Hand scheme. The employer who, when paying whatever is due to that deceased employee, when paying to the survivor, who is they are liable to deduct the relevant pay. And apart from that, we cannot find in any of the legislations in Nigeria that covers 
the inheritance tax the way it was specified in the Abrogated Capital Transfer Tax Act, where the asset is aggregated and there are, you know, there are various rates applicable to the assets, you know, before a final tax. But like I said, that was abolished in 1993. The general feeling was that, of course, those who have the largest, the biggest wealth are the ones that will suffer the redistribution of wealth. And as such, it's in their interest to, to abolish it. But in the United Kingdom, we are familiar with the inheritance, inheritance, inheritance tax scheme, where even if you transfer asset while you are living, if you die before seven years to that, you'll be liable to pay the tax on that transfer as if um, the transfer was done at the date of death. Um, like I said, there's not much in a tax law. Mm -hmm. You can say um, inheritance or assets that are left behind by a deceased person uh, it will, be, will be liable to tax. Other than the ten percent estate duty that is charged by most of the uh, state high courts when letter of administration is being applied. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to ask the legality of that 10%. I don't know whether Mr. Quick has, wants to help us with that. You know, so this 10% that is assessed on the, um, on the value of the assets, is there, is there some legal um, backing for that? Well, absolutely. There is actually a legal backing for it. Um, mm -hmm. It's contained... Can I just in... comment before he answers? Oh, I'm going to... Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Quakers. Oh, were you were you saying something, Miss? Okay, Miss Chibuto, you wanted to say something. No, I, I just wanted to say that it's even more than ten percent because oh, right. if you oh. want it uh, expedited, you still have to pay under the table. So you know, we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Let's 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 deal with it. Let's let's deal with the table table. first. <laughs> 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 so it's, it's okay. Yes. <laughs> of course, the section in relation to probate is mm. clearly stated there. The probate rules. Um, mm. it, it's not something that they came up with. Is but like uh, Chief uh, Chibutu to say. There are a number of other associated costs, but officially, the ten percent is backed up by law, and also under the High Court law of Lagos State, the section on probate law provides for the, the sum being paid. If you take the High Court rules at the back, it stated clearly what the assessment will be and what you're going to pay, and that's why when you bring the application, the assessment is done on it officially, and then you make payment. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we, we we can do on our own. Also, eh? Okay, uh, we do have all sort of levies, duties, and all sort of charges. Mm. You see, no matter the nomenclature we give it, all are taxes. Absolutely. And I know that you cannot charge a tax unless there's a specific legislation that backs, you know, a direct legislation that backs the imposition of that tax. And there is, only one, there is only one body that is charged with the duty of collecting taxes and all revenue due to the federal government of Nigeria, which is the Federal Inland Revenue Service, under the Federal Inland Revenue Service Act of 2007. Any other entity introducing charges under different nomenclature, uh, <laughs> Actually, the law. I, I, I don't, we will go on and on about this, but you see, the law is very clear. You recall that we're operating as it were. Well, similarly, a federal, federal system. system. Absolutely. Yes. So the state also have power to also um, raise revenue, what they describe as 
internally generated revenue. And part of it is well, Mr. Qu Mr. Quivers, I and if I can say, I think, I think you know, you know how it is. Um, it's still at some point somebody will go and test it, you know, and say that yes, my property happens to be in Lagos State. Uh, but I'm also subject to federal law. But you know, that's that's a conversation for another day. You, we've had a very interesting conversation, but we, you know, our audience have also asked very interesting questions. You know, so in the, in the few minutes that is left, we'll try and take as many of the uh, questions in the Q and A as as we can. Um, so this this first one, I'll just address to to Miss. Um, um, Agaba or Lodger, if you don't mind. Um, how often should one update their will? Um, you know, as we know that assets are not static. Um, should we should we update our will annually um, every time there's a major change or what? That's that's the first question. I would I would ask a few others. Um, the other one, still for you, what are the um, tax implications of intervivals will? Mr. Conde has told us um, that there are really no tax implications apart from those levies on. Um, on um, bequeath, on uh, gifts that are made there in will. But what if we give the will in the course of our lifetime? So Mr. Conde, perhaps you'll try to answer that for us. Um, family assets holding a company is a great idea for future assets, but title transfer for existing um, assets is expensive. Um, maybe Emmy would also want to uh, look at that, even the fact that you mentioned it in the course of a, a presentation, meaning that using an asset uh, company. Uh, what's the recourse if a trust is poorly managed, uh, poor investment decisions leading to value erosion? That's also a question for Amy. I know that in, in some jurisdictions, um, you can actually uh, get sued as a trustee. Um, would like to know what the position is in Nigeria. Uh, what are the indicative costs of setting up a trust. So we'll take those round of questions first. Um, the first set for Amy and then the one on the tax implications of the gift in survivors um, by Mr. Conde. Okay, thank you. So I'll just answer that. So how often should you update your will as your circumstances change? For instance, if you've nominated someone as a beneficiary in your will and the person passes on, you really can't still have that person on as your beneficiary. You need to update it. So whatever works for you, but as your circumstances change, it's important to effect those changes in your will. The other question spoke was speaking to how um, trusts are poorly managed. There are provisions in the trust deed that can actually fire a trustee in the trust deed. Once a trust is set up, there will be rules around how the assets in the trust are to be managed. You can also have provisions in the trust to have what's called a protector. The protector will ensure that the terms of the trust are aligned with what has been written in the letter of wishes. So you can actually fire a trustee if it's properly managed and it's not in line with the investment objectives that have been set up. The other question spoke about the cost of setting up a trust. Usually there's an establishment cost. There's usually a cost also associated with the administration and management as well. But every different, every individual, you need to have an understanding of what they are seeking to do, what the assets in question are. We had mentioned that the assets, you must own it before you can bring it into the trust. So you cannot, you can't just nominate any asset that's not yours into the trust. Then the question around the intervivors um, gifts and the cost that is associated with um, transfer of title, especially real estate, because most people would have purchased their assets in their individual names. Now in transferring real estate, it is treated as a sale and a purchase. So it's not, it's not a question of saying, oh, you're just giving the gifts or you're just moving the gifts. No, they will treat it as a sale and a purchase. And every, every government is looking to raise income from this. So the lands registry will say that you are selling from yourself and the trust is buying. So all the statutory fees that are applicable to that transaction is usually what is applicable. I believe that those are all the questions I was asked. If I missed anyone, please draw my attention to it. Thank you. Yes, you have answered. I think the other one was for Mr. Conde on the tax implications. Okay. For, I'm yes, um, like you said, when you transfer assets from yourself to another person where you are living, um, yes, she, she got it right. When you transfer that asset, the title to yourself, all the associated costs Time duty, capital gains tax, all of that will be liable to pay. Now, 
in, in the only provision in the Capital Gains Tax Act where you may escape CGT is if that asset that you are donating to another person was actually donated to you too. Then that capital gains tax of debt or need you make. But once that is not a donated asset that you are further donating to another person, you will be liable to pay off. Now, no matter what you do, even if the cost is zero, practically, you're dealing with registering title. Lagos State, and I believe other states also have this practice. Depending on the location, they already have a template of what the value will be, irrespective of what you put in the deed of transfer. So you will be assessed on the basis of the value based on the location of that asset. And you will be liable to pay the stamp duty, the capital gains tax. You will even be made to pay the income tax of the person transferring it if the person has not been paying income tax. Uh, if he has been paying and you submit, if in the opinion of the LIRS, the value of he has been paying suggests that he has additional tax liability. That is the practical experience that you have with change of title, um, registry title. So whether you move it before you are dead or you leave it until you die, um, there is little room for maneuvering under the Nigerian tax regime. Right, thank can you, I, thank you very can much. Can I just, can I add to this, if you don't mind? Please go ahead, please go ahead. Now, now Lagos State has a unique approach to this. Gift intervivals attracts what they describe as ad valorem um, uh, tax, face value. Now, if it's a property, la a landed property, you know, ordinarily, because of the provisions of the Land Use Act, every transfer requires the consent of the government. Mm -hmm. And so because of that requirement, you're made to pay uh, certain statutory levies and fees. But once there's evidence that what you have is a gift, now, when you approach the state government with the evidence that it's a gift, what you're now being made to pay is just what they describe as face value. Now, face value could come in different forms. It could be face value based on the capital value of the property. It could be face value based on what you have disclosed. That look, okay, well, there's no need to come up with the percentage. Just pay a token for the purpose of affecting your title. So that's my own addition to, to what uh, Mr. Tadi Lakode said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a question here. I'll direct it to um, Chief Ijikwe. Um, must siblings be beneficiaries in a will after given spouse and children? Uh, does the will get nullified if siblings are not given part of the asset? Is it thank you so much for them to yes. challenge? Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, again, I, I think uh, we always have to bear the, 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 the issues that I mentioned about the fallacy of a will and the fallacy of uh, dying in test it. Uh, and that the, the ideal situation is to try and strike a balance. So the issue is always, um, you know, where, where are you supporting your siblings when you were alive? Uh, usually, if you're supporting your siblings when you are alive, and then you don't make a similar uh, provision in your will, uh, there's that opportunity to challenge. In fact, in other countries, you have a right to challenge, you know? So um, I, what I always advise is um, please uh, try to do the same thing that um, uh, you did in your lifetime. At the same time, what I've also found out is that you have to manage it in such a way that you actually try not to, it's good to empower the nuclear family so that they would replace you. Because when you are in charge and you are making the decisions, your siblings really don't argue with you. You do what you want. But if you give them too much rights into the estate, and then since they are older than your children, you, you may lose the transfer that you want to do to your direct nuclear family. So what we advise people is that make a provision so like we'll have a, a clause, I'll say, um, I, I have taken care of 
this person in my lifetime and I've made adequate provision. However, I leave him X fixed amount, you know, make it fixed. And uh, uh, again, we find that when it comes to the, like the management of the estate, you have to be very careful. The siblings that you bring in um, into the management is whether to keep it within the nuclear family uh, or to have a professional trust company uh, to, to run it. In, in fact, even between yesterday and today, I've, I've been uh, 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 dealing with a particular estate where the executors just don't agree and they keep fighting and the estate is being uh, dissipated. As it were not really dissipated, they've just left it to rot. Let me put it that way, because they can't agree. They have uh, sibling issues and ego issues is affecting their commercial decision. And they would rather not even rent out a property uh, because they are worried of who rented it out. Even if the money is going to the same estate account, it's unbelievable. So you see a lot of cases where they just uh, fight to self-destruct as it were. So these emotions, at times that's why people bring in professionals, but professionals cost money uh, as well. If you bring in a professional trust uh, company, but you, you have to balance it depending on the SMS. size of your estate. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I said professionals are expensive, particularly if they are senior advocates. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you were talking of trust companies. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but, I have but a question. you know, it depends on the size of the estate. If if, the, if it's worth it, then I think you should have the professionals. Yes, if it's worth Absolutely. it. But um, otherwise, so we always advise depending on the size of the estate. And the size is relative, well, you know, it's uh, subjective. I mean, I might have just that <laughs> one bedroom somewhere, and that might be all that I have, and I think it's significant. Okay. Uh, I have a question for you, Mr. Quakers. It's uh, relating to a comment that you made. Um, so the question is, uh, I'm not sure I understand Mr. Quakers' essay, and when he said that the court upheld a property given to a mistress by a testator, whereas in another case, a matrimonial house was given to a wife, notwithstanding that she may not have contributed to the property. My question then is, where does the law draw the line? In what circumstances will a testator give out property to a mistress unchallenged as a matrimonial asset? Very, very good question. Um, earlier, I cited the case of Johnson and Maja, where the testator gave uh, his assets or some of his assets to his mistress, a concubine, and the living wife challenged it unsuccessfully. Now the court on the basis of her challenge to it that she didn't challenge it based on mental capacity. In other words, there are conditions by which you can challenge a will. Now she didn't put forward the fact that they jointly owned the property and that he didn't have the authority to give unlike the matrimonial uh, case that I referred to about matrimonial property. What is a matrimonial property? The court defined matrimonial property as a property jointly owned by husband and wife. Whether the wife contributed towards the acquisition of the property or not is irrelevant. If the property was acquired in the pendency of the marriage, it is deemed to be jointly owned, whether she added to it or not. Now, in his lifetime, if he so decides to give out that property in his will without recourse to the fact that it's a matrimonial property. And that's why this concept of survivorship now comes in. It is jointly owned. He can only give a portion of his, and he can also give it without the consent of his spouse. And that's just the difference. I hope I've answered your question. Absolutely, thank you for the clarification. Uh, Mr. Akwande wants to chip in something. Uh, thank you very much. I just felt that for the benefit of the participant, it is important to, uh, in, in relation to management of estate, um, the, I support the suggestion about using corporate trust companies. And um, of course, I had a comment about cost, but for the benefit of participant, not only cost, the one, a major consideration is the time to really sit, discuss, and manage this estate the way you wish it when you are nominating, you know, the, the people, the trustees to your estate. Uh, in most cases, people may not have the time that you think they would dedicate 
you know, to this matter. So for that reason, um, we may need to look beyond cost and look at actually having the time and attention that the, the, the affairs will require um, at the material time. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Kondi, very valid. Um, Mrs. Akaba Oloch, I'll come back to you now with this question. It's actually um, a valid one that, um, you know, we probably should address our minds to. So given all that we have said, um, and in your opinion, what are the most important reasons? I mean, everybody seems to know that it's important to, to, to plan our estates and particularly to write wills. Uh, but what is in your opinion, um, your experience, why most eligible persons in Nigeria do not take the necessary action despite the awareness of wills and trust? You've dealt with clients, you've tried to persuade them to do it. What would you say is the predominant reason or reasons why they still don't do so? I know you alluded to that or some of it in your uh, presentation. So most people is fear. Some people think that if they put together their wheels or put a plan in place, they are going to actually die. I had a client say to me, every time she picks up the document, she's afraid. And I said, look, nothing will happen to you. Strangely, most people that even have rules are not the ones dying. It's the ones that don't put those things in place. Another yeah, thing is yeah. procrastination. So you find out that some people, I'll do it, I'll do it. Then when they're on a trip, they're traveling, they're in a flight, they'll now call you, okay, so I need to do this thing. I will do it when I come back. And when they come back and you follow through, they'll be like, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it. Another thing too, sometimes for some people is that they really don't have the time to sit down and ascertain where the assets that they have are. So everything is just scattered everywhere. And we try to advise them to say, you know what, once you, once you are aware, strike when the iron is hot. As you remember anything, because truth be told, it's only you that knows where the assets you have are. As you remember, just write it down. Have a, a book, you just write the things down and then begin to find out where it is. You really don't have to know exactly what or how much. Speak to your, the company, the private company where you bought the shares from. Ask the company secretary how, just say that they send you things, just take out time. This weekend is good enough. Take out time, send out everywhere you've parted the money with, that they should just send you the insurance companies if there's a policy in place, the stockbrokers, CSCS statements, your, just actually dealing it is one of those things that we need. And this is why these sessions are good to Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Yes. You know, I think the question got frozen. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Can I, can I add to it? Yes, please, Mr. 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 Now, Mr. some years ago, I had um, a client um, who is late now, a retired high court judge. I was so impressed with his lifestyle. What did he do while he was alive? He identified all his assets and distributed them to his children without a will. Now, subsequently, he now wrote a will. The will that we drew up for him at that time nearly identified his other assets, like shares, stock, personal effects. And that was the distribution that he made. Now, in his lifetime, the children knew what they were going to possess. Now, you, earlier, you, you referred to, okay, well, I think it was uh, Mrs. Onoja that referred to the young man who threw his father out of, no, you were, yeah, you, you were the one who threw his father out of uh, the property that had been given to him in his lifetime. Now, what this man did in his lifetime was that the family house was excluded from the will. And then in his will, he just said that that house would remain a family house and not to be sold. Every child of these had already been given. So you have a hybrid. Now, any time you hear of um, a person that has, has, has passed, the passage of anyone, the first thing that comes to your mind is what will happen to his estates. Now, if you have tidied your affairs in terms of giving out things while you are alive, that will not even it's arise. Sad. That will not be a concern. But again, even if you haven't done so, the problem will always be that when letters of registration are taken, because when a person dies intestate, he opens himself up to letters of registration. Borrowing the words of one of our top lawyers who has uh, also passed, he said dead men are not bothered as to what, what is happening to those who are alive. Once he crosses the gates, 
then he doesn't want to bother himself as what is going on with the people who are on this side of life that is gone. Whatever they want to do is entirely up to them. But it's relatively important that uh, gift intervivals is embraced and it is done while the, the, uh, don the, the donor of the gift is, is very much around and very much alive. So that you limit the will to just few items. Absolutely. Sorry, can I also add to that, uh, please? Yes, very quickly, sir. Um, very quickly. Okay, thank you. I just want to agree with Mr. Quick, our senior advocate, um, that it's, it has to be a balance. Uh, and the other point is um, the other reason why you need actually to give some things out whilst you are alive is what's the purpose of holding on, on to all those your properties? You know, and you are not empowering your children or those you want to empower uh, and making them uh, learn how to use property uh, before you're dead. Because by the time you're dead, you give them so much, they don't know what to do with it. They don't have the skills. You didn't. You, you should focus not only on transferring properties, but transferring skill and knowledge. And this is where you need to have like family constitution. You, you have to have a family council. You, you have to have a, a decision process of how they get into the business, who will get into the business. Uh, what, what will the compensation be? What I've seen uh, some cases where the, you put the person in the in the business, then you say, oh, it's my child. You don't pay him. And then the person starts stealing from the business, <laughs> you know, or the person is waiting for when you will go. So they will take it, you know, you, 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 the, the, the business, you put them in the business, they declare profit. When the profit is declared, the, 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 the testator will take the whole thing. They don't even get any incentive bonus as if they were employees you know, et cetera. So there are lots of planning that you need to do in your lifetime, not just uh, for it to take effect from your death. And also the other example I want to give is that I see in Nigeria when people do will, they will list all the properties in the will. Now here in, in Canada, they don't list them in the will. However, the lawyer, the lawyer will be required to actually have a form where all the properties are listed confirmed, another thing is confirm the titles because if you go and list it in the wheel and it has the wrong title, you may have issues of how do you transfer it. So the, the, there's how it is done here. It's slightly different from Nigeria. And I'm not saying it must be done that way, you know, but they have the listing of the properties. Then when you have finished and you have signed, you have a complimentary card, which you put inside your wallet. And it basically just says, if anything happens, you, you see this, you contact this address, that's the address of the lawyer. And that solves some of those problems about um, maybe a, a twin brother going to the uh, bank to collect money bank. and the rest, because it triggers the process <laughs> immediately. So there is really a lot of practical planning that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Some of the suggestions that we have made involves maybe changing the law in, in Nigeria to upgrade it such that we cannot just rely on only the will, but mm. also that the default system is robust enough to mm. ensure that there is a proper planning and that you don't forget certain uh, groups of uh, people, uh, et cetera, in, in how you plan your, your will. And that will push people to make sure that when they are writing their will, they write it properly to make sure that the, the problem is minimized uh, post um, uh, yeah. uh, uh, the, 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 you know, because what I see today is that the way is the freedom is just so much that people mm. write wills that then result in problems, uh, problems after. They, uh, so they absolutely. need instruction, they need guidance from professionals. Mm. Thank you. Can I just say one or two things? I just wanted to add, yes, yes. Quickly, so, uh, from the female perspective, just mm. from the female perspective, you mm. know, first of all, there is an issue of fear which is what is prevalent. And women probably think that they don't have much to pass on. You have all your jewelry, which costs more than, you know, I, I don't know what to say. You have all your laces. These are things that you can, you, and you want to, you know those you want to inherit those things, but you have to specify them. In addition to, you know where you want to be buried and how you want to be buried. Those are the issues for the will. And I think education will, teach us, uh, there should be more education along that line. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, thank you very much. I'll just take one last question from the uh, Q&A before I ask um, each panelist, so you can start thinking of your um, passing statement uh, whilst we just take this question and I'll have uh, Chief Itibe answer it. 
um, should offshore assets be included in a will made in Nigeria? And will such a will be recognized in the offshore jurisdiction where the assets are domiciled? Or is it best to have a private off offshore will for offshore assets? Your, your, your music. Okay, yeah. Your, thank you. Thank you so much for that question. I was uh, hoping I read it and I was hoping that I'll have the opportunity to address it. Um, yes, you can have one wheel if you wish, and then that wheel can be a global wheel. Um, uh, and then the, the, you can uh, now have it, um, you, you know, received. You have the grant in Nigeria, you receive it in the different uh, countries where you have property. But I can assure you that that is usually more expensive uh, because the laws are quite different in different uh, countries. And uh, there are tax issues, which uh, uh, we didn't mention, the cross-border tax implication, where depending on where they regard as your primary habitat or residence, you know, some countries have global taxation. So if it's like America today, and then they decide, they, they hold that you are resident, you are, you are resident in America, then they would tax the, all the properties everywhere, including all the ones in Nigeria, right? So that, that's a challenge. So for purpose of proper tax management, et cetera, it's advisable to have separate uh, wheels for the separate countries. It minimizes the issues. Uh, I, I can't go into all the complications. Apart from tax, I mean, there yeah. are so many complications. So just have each one for each country. It, it solves the problem, but you, the Nigerian wheel can be recognized anywhere, but it has implications. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so, so much. Just a quick one. Just a quick one to what... Sorry, just to also add, the revocation the clause will be removed so that it doesn't revoke any other will. The revocation other clause will. has to be removed. Yes, you, 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 yes thank you. You will state from the, that from this the, from the both is of limited, them. Is limited yeah. to my properties uh, in this country. Uh, so, so you limit it. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Now, Pekaz. One minute. One minute. Please. Yes, just a minute. That, that question also needs to address the Nigerian angle because there are times when you have properties in Lagos. You also have properties in Portaco. You have properties in Benin, right? And then in your will, you distribute your properties accordingly. Are you aware that you have uh, uh, different laws applicable to the bequest that you have made? And so when you register, what you pay in Lagos is not the same you're going to pay in Calabar. So that's also the Nigerian perspective to the global question that was asked. And I mean, it's also important that we look at that. When we're busy acquiring yeah. properties all around the country, we also need to identify the laws that also operate and govern uh, bequests within our land as well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Oh, Just thank to you. add to that, thank one of the much. things that we yeah. considered, like if we have to perfect the uh, will, like dead probate or dead letters of administration, we usually, and there's property in two states, we find that uh, we go, we'll go and first uh, get the uh, probate or the letters in the state where it's easy to get it. And mm -hmm. then come to the state where it's more difficult to only do resealing because uh, it may be more difficult to do the, <laughs> the original grant from that state. So, I mean, it, there's a lot of uh, space for maneuvering, but it's the same, yes, the, the, the international system is mirrored in our federal system. That's correct. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. I, I, I really, we really have to end. We really have to end now. Uh, I'll just have you all, and Mr. Kondi, you can start with your one minute um, summary. You know, what, what's, what's passing word would you like to leave? Um, our audience with uh, today. Mr. Thank Kondi. you very much. Uh, the first thing I will say is that, yes, I know that lawyers try all sorts of arrangement based on the law in various jurisdictions. But as far as taxation is concerned, the basis of taxation in Nigeria is residency. So if you are a resident, if you are, is that it is your worldwide income is accessible, as well as even if you have assets abroad. I'm sure we are familiar with um, the last exercise about four years ago about V, you know, the uh, voluntary asset declaration and all that. So wherever those assets are, for as long as you are Nigerian or you are a Nigerian resident, liable to tax in Nigeria, your worldwide income and assets, assets are liable to tax. Having said that, um, 
when you consider all the complications and implications that have been discussed, uh, my advice would be for people to take a good look at their estates while still alive and make an arrangement that will minimize the paperwork and the, in, and the cost that will lead to cost effective arrangement in terms of uh, whatever you can transfer while you are still living and be able to deal with the associated cost, please do it. Um, Thank I'm, you very much. Apart from that, I think uh, it's good to do a will. Mm -hmm. And Thank you. to be very clear and to do it and let the administrator be a corporate body. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kunde. Uh, Mr. Quakers. For me, I would suggest that uh, we have a hybrid. Um, do gift intervivals while you are alive, give out all the things that you need to give, and then do a will for your personal property, your personal things like jewelry, clothes, and all of that. Shares, stock, uh, real estate should be done by way of gift intervivals. Give out such things while you're yet alive. And like um, Chief Anthony Dibbe said, SAN, that uh, also, there's also the need to uh, give out capacity, uh, knowledge, uh, ideas, uh, draw your beneficiaries closer to understudy perhaps maybe your line of business or what you're into to embrace it while you're yet alive so that there'll be no doubt as to who is inheriting what. So that's, that's my closing remark on this. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Chief Chibosito. I agree with all the previous uh, speakers, and I, I, I also stress the fact that there is no discrimination. The, the, first, first of all, that we will die is a certainty. We pray that we live I will be over 100 years old, but we will, that everybody who is born will die is a certainty. It is, it, it is then therefore important that we stress, we will make plans for how we want to live the, the, this world. I, I buy the, um, uh, the suggestion that what you can uh, dispose of in your lifetime, you dispose of, you know, and uh, uh, whatever you don't dispose of in your lifetime, please spell out what you want done in, in, a, in, a, written, in a written form and make, make sure that it is uh, uh, given to people who will uh, um, give effect to it when you are gone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, Chief Idibe, final word. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, in my view, uh, estate planning or succession planning is a strategy for passing on leadership and ownership roles in a business or asset to, the, to your children, your employee or group of employees or successors to your assets or your business. So waiting to speak from death may be too late as the culture, discipline, governance, know-how, and wherewithal to manage wealth may not have been effectively transferred to the beneficiaries at the time of death. If you do it by a will or intestate. So you have to have a mix of strategies to move things whilst you are alive. Give properties, bring them into the business, make them accountable, have standards that and the uh, constitution that they have to comply with if it's a big business, you know, have a way you recruit experts to help them manage the business, put them in decision making, make sure they are remunerated. It's not just transferring property, if they are involved in the business, you know, uh, uh, build that culture before you go. Because when you go, if they don't have the culture, they will dissipate the estate. They will not sustain it. That's the problem. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Agaba Oloja, final words. Thank you. For me, it's take action. Start now. Don't procrastinate. Ascertain what you do have. Write it down. Determine how the assets are owned. Determine what works. Find out who the beneficiaries are. Like everyone has said, if you have dependents now, don't leave them out. Put a plan in place. Speak to professionals that will guide you to do it. And once that has been done, you'll be rest assured that you can be peaceful in mind and body so that when the inevitable does happen, your families will be thanking you. 
even as you have gone while they are crying like my friend says they'll be seeing road because you would have probably left some guidance and direction for them thank you absolutely thank you thank you so very much um i know that there are lots of questions in the q a that we haven't taken if we had another hour it still wouldn't be enough for us to finish um you know, responding to all those questions. I've had a very interesting afternoon. I've learned so much from this wonderful uh, panel that I've had the privilege of moderating. I hope that the audience have, has also enjoyed it as much as I have. In, in closing, all I would just like to say, you know, I would like to just re-emphasize uh, what Chief Idikwe said, you know, about the, not just passing the assets or what I would uh, term as actually transferring a legacy. You know, so we shouldn't be so mindful about just transferring uh, the houses, um, the cars, the jewelry, and what have you. But you know, the knowledge, um, you know, the bequeathing a legacy is what we should be, and we can do. We should do all that in our lifetime, and we shouldn't, like we have all said, uh, speak uh, from the grave. So thank you very much for being such a fantastic panel. Um, I will now hand over to um, the DG to formally uh, thank us all. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Moderator, uh, DG, sir, if you just allow me for a few minutes, I know you know how to dish out uh, thanks. That's, uh, you've done it over the years. I just want to say very quickly that uh, I've been hearing people, uh, Dr. Shuna invited me, Dr. Shuna talked to me. I want to say here that the committee that I have now is a fantastic committee made up of top doctors, industrial pharmacist, a real life royal highness. Uh, you know, I, I feel very, you know, uh, lucky to have been able to serve with such giants. And uh, I, I want to thank the Institute for reappointing me on a number of years to chair that committee. And I think I've done fairly well, given my average uh, ability. Uh, and to say that this is the crowning. And with this, I would like to be exiting the health committee because there are so many giants in that committee now. I would like to say farewell to this committee as I'm winding down some of my commitments. I want to thank everybody for the opportunity, especially all of my friends here that are on this panel. And I wish you well. I hope I have enough property to engage uh, uh, an Idigbe or uh, uh, Norisin or a Conde. Uh, Miss Chibututu is my sister, so she would uh, be, be kind. Free of charge. Free mm -hmm. of charge, thank you. So that's all I have to say. Please we help will me. Report, we, will re, we will report her to MBA if she does it. <laughs> so please, could you help me thank members of my committee? They were simply wonderful. And then I want to thank Ms. Uh, Edoc, uh, Teresa, who doesn't have respect for time. She calls me, she called me at 2 a.m. today. You know, uh, I want to report her to you. She is like my slave driver. She calls me any time, not, not knowing wherever I am. She, and then, I'm sorry, sir, good morning. No, it's good evening. So, so thank you very much. DJ, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And um, a very wonderful evening to everyone. Uh, first, I want to say a very big thank you to all the participants. Um, they made our presence here very, very worthwhile, especially with the various comments that they've, um, uh, they've expressed in the chat room. I have been looking at everything. Uh, normally in my role, I want to do a kind of quick evaluation of what we've done and I've been greatly encouraged that we've done the right thing uh, with the kind of comment we have received. And of course, that now takes me to the panelists and the guest speakers, uh, the guest speaker um, uh, herself. Uh, I want to say a very big thank you. The accolade we have received today is because of the wonderful work that uh, the moderator, the, the keynote speaker, and the panelists have, have, have done. And uh, with that, I want to first thank uh, Mrs. B.C. Adeyemi, MIOD, for the wonderful work she did this afternoon. Uh, she, she expertly handled this very, very uh, star-studded, I would say star-studded uh, uh, panel. So I want to say very thank you to you, Madam, for the wonderful 
for the wonderful way you have moderated this panel. And of course, to the keynote speaker, uh, Mrs. Emmy Agaba Oloja, I want to say a very big thank you, madam. You, you, the way you put up this, the subject, you made it, uh, you made it fun to listen to you. And uh, as you are dropping those very important points, it was just going in even to me. And I think to everyone that is um, on this program today, uh, to our Lionel Silks, uh, I want to say a very big thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Norrison Koeka, SAN, Chief Anthony Digbe, SAN Fellow of the Institute. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, uh, I know very much that uh, Chief Digbe uh, really, really convenient himself to be here because I know you are not in Nigeria. I say very big thank you. And uh, Mr. Koeka, thank you very much, sir. We, we really appreciate your presence. And of course, to our distinguished fellow, uh, Ms. Ngozi Chibututu, you have always been there for us. And um, I am not surprised that you are here again. I say a very big thank you. You made very, very good. One thing I always like about your point is that you come down to the basic. Thank you very, very much, madam. Uh, and you can see the appreciation in the chat room of some of, from some of the participants. And uh, to Chief uh, Tajuddin Akonde, uh, a fellow of the Institute too, we say a very big thank you to you. You brought uh, a different perspective, which is which is the finance part of it, the tax part of it, something that uh, sometimes people are very wary of, but you made it so clear and uh, also taught people how they can also work within their means and still be a responsible citizen. Thank you very much. Uh, to the chairman of the... Um, our health committee. Well, I don't know uh, whether it is allowed for you to throw in a resignation on the floor of a webinar. Mm -hmm. I, I, Retirement. I, that, is the, that, is, that is for the president to decide. But be that as it may, I must confess, Chief, uh, uh, Dr. Shona, you have done a wonderful job. Uh, this, this, this webinar really touched people in the right places. And this is evident by the way they have responded. It touched people in the right places. And this is what the Institute, it's not just about uh, profit and laws, uh, governance. We must also take care of the individual. And that is what IOD has done today through your committee. I want to thank you. And I want to thank the members of the committee too for this wonderful uh, 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 webinar. Uh, COVID has brought new things. Uh, yes, uh, they say it's only an ill wind that blows no good. Uh, so. COVID has brought some very wonderful things, and I thank God for this opportunity that we've had today. And I also thank you and members of your committee. And of course, to our chief host, uh, the president who has facilitated and um, given us the environment within which to put this together. I say a very big thank you, uh, Mr. President, Chief Chris Okuno, fellow of the Institute. Um, I say thank you to you. You've been here from the beginning and you are here till till the end. I thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and of course, uh, to the Secretariat. And I will particularly mention um, Teresa, just like you did. Uh, Teresa, uh, the Secretary of the Committee, Mrs. Teresa Idok, I want to say thank you to you. Uh, sometimes when we give these uh, responsibilities, you start wondering, oh, well, this is not what I signed for. Why is the DG giving me this? But you can see how you have excelled in this, in this, uh, in managing this committee, and the testimony being given by the chairman. Well done. I want to thank all other members of the secretariat who have supported you to make this, uh, to make this happen. I want to say a very big thank you to everyone, and I wish you a very wonderful evening and a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much, Amas. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gal. Uh, Tony, as bye usual, bye. I was aware I was going to miss miss out on this session because uh, it's a learning curve for some of us, you know, uh, particularly those of us ready, getting ready to be 